Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, it is good to be here. Um, I'm not sure uh, how you're feeling this morning as we have uh, set up our space again, kind of normal and, and feeling like we're closer together. It was an odd thing. Uh, for us to set it up and think, oh, that seems really close <laughs> when we've spent so much time being, you know, six feet apart. But um, we are grateful for your cooperation and just showing your vaccine passports. Uh, as I said in the information that I sent out this week, it's just a one-time thing because we know you, your regular people that, that come to church. We'll keep track of that. And uh, we will just you know, soldier on together, it, uh, but it does seem a little bit weird, but so very good, so very good for us to be together. Yes. <laughs> oh. And, and welcome uh, to those who are visiting with us this morning. We, we, have, um, we had baptism last week. We have another baptism and confirmation this week. It is a busy time. And um, I know that many of us will not know uh, this Lily who's being baptized today, but I married her parents <laughs> a while ago, and uh, Jeff and Paige, and they live in Ingersoll, and um, then, you know, had talked to me about... Uh, baptism and then you know of course COVID so finally we're here together to uh, to celebrate that baptism and we're glad that you are here in the midst of all of that celebrating as it is in a church family we celebrate these joys but we also have sad news in the passing of Arthur Wilson this week and many of you uh, I'm sure know Art he hasn't been worshiping with us uh, lately as he's been in a nursing home, but, but we do extend our sympathies to uh, the Wilson family in this time. The service will be on a uh, private service on Tuesday, but I do believe if you go to the Ostranders website, there is um, an opportunity to register there for visitation. Um, so I'd encourage you to check that out. And so we are here. <laughs> we are here. Our Christ candle is lit. We are together. And I invite us into our call to worship, and your response, as always, is in bold. Children of God, welcome. Welcome to this space where there is love and grace. Welcome to this space where there is hope and perseverance. God invites all to receive the good news. We are welcome just as you are. We are loved just as you are. In gratitude for all this, let us worship God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. O oh God, you broke down the barriers when you crept in beside us. In Jesus, your hands touched all and touched us. You opened our eyes to see how the hands of the rich were empty and the hearts of the poor were full. You took the widow's might and the child's loaves and used them to show us the kingdom. Here in the company of the neighbor whom we know and the stranger in our midst and the self from whom we turn, we ask to love as Jesus loved. Make this the place and time, good Lord, when heaven and earth become one, and we in word and flesh know ourselves beloved. Amen. So if you received my extra piece of correspondence, you will know that uh, in sacrificing the social distancing, we're not able to sing if we are not six feet apart. But we're going to sing anyway. If you want to move yourself around so that you're able to sing, if you just want to hum along, however you want to, uh, however you want to manage this time of singing together, <laughs> we're going to. Uh, you do have to have your mask on, though. Um, uh, we do. We are going to st stand and sing or hum or just enjoy the words of uh, "Holy, Holy, Holy." Three fifteen in our voices united.
colleagues. You may be seated. Uh, as I said, we are celebrating baptism today, and if you uh, joined us last week, you'll know I, I uh, had said to you that uh, part of my tradition in doing baptism is, is passing around the water to warm it up so that poor Lily doesn't get a shock on the forehead when we perform the act of baptism, and normally we would pass that through our congregation. Of course, we can not really permitted to do that, but the family can, can do that. So uh, we're going to sing our baptismal hymn, it's Creator of the Water, and I'm going to just invite the family to uh, just pass it. And if your hands are like mine, that are never really very warm, take a minute to get them warmed up, uh, and then just pass this uh, to each other, and then the last person can, can come up and bring it forward, or I will come and get it to you. So uh, the rest of us, you may remain seated as we sing uh, Creator of the Water. <laughs> sacrament of baptism proclaims and celebrates the grace of God. By water and the Spirit we are called, claimed, and commissioned. We are called God's own, welcomed as children of God. We are claimed by Christ and united with Christ. Hear this record of Jesus' radical concern for welcoming children. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might bless them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will not enter it. And Jesus took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. On behalf of the congregation of Nanaka United Church, I present the following person 
for initiation into the body of Christ through baptism. Lillian Cecilia Simpson. to keep some some space. In the presence of this community of faith, do you commit yourself to follow the way of Christ in your private and public life? I do. Do you believe in one God, creator, Christ, and spirit? I do. I do. Will you support the life and work of Christ's church? I will. I will. will you nurture your child and together grow in faith? I will. And to the godparents I ask, will you pray for this child and take care that she may learn and live the faith? I will. I will. God, God may, may help her. I'll invite the congregation to please stand. <clears throat> getting some feedback from my microphone, so I apologize. <laughs> Let us pledge to these persons our support and care. As a baptized and baptizing church, we commit ourselves to support and uphold you within the community of faith. May God grant us all the grace to live out our baptism. And as we are standing together, let us join together in the words of our new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit, who trusts in God. We are called to be the Church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect to in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Gracious and Holy One, we bless you for the gift of life and within it, the gift of water. Over its unshaped promise, your spirit hovered at creation. By water comes the growth of the earth. Through water, you led the children of Israel to freedom. In the waters of the Jordan, your child, Jesus, was baptized. Now may your spirit be upon us in what we do, that this water may be a sign for all of new life in Christ, in whose name we pray. What is this child's name? Lillian Cecilia Simpson. Okay. Ready, Lily? <laughs> I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, one more, and of the Holy Spirit, and with the sign of the cross, <laughs> you are claimed as Christ forever. Lily, the power of the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of the water and spirit, you may be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. And I'm going to light our baptismal candle from our Christ candle. As a symbol that you do carry the light with you, I'll give that to you, Jeff, so you can get it. 
there's not. And Lillian, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to God. Into the household of faith, we welcome you with joy and thanksgiving. We are members of the body of Christ. We are inheritors of God's promise. In the name of Christ, we welcome you. And normally we would kind of go around and let everybody uh, uh, welcome Lillian individually, but uh, we cannot do that, but we will just share our welcome in applause. And we will sing our uh, baptismal blessing as Carol presents our certificate and Bible. And you can just blow that candle out, Jeff, as you can make your way back to the seat. Can we, can we take some pictures now? Or? You can do it now. Or after it was best for you. Yep. At various times on our faith journey, we have opportunities to profess or reaffirm our faith and receive full membership into the United Church of Canada. We've already joyfully welcomed Lily through baptism, and now we prepare to welcome Tim and Donna through the celebration of confirmation. On behalf of Mount Alton Church, I present the following persons whom we welcome into the full membership of this community of faith. Tim Norris and Donna Morris. Uh, Tim and Donna, I ask these questions that you may publicly profess the faith proclaimed in baptism. Do you believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, and who works in us and others by the Spirit? I do, by the grace of God. Desiring the freedom of new life in Christ, do you seek to resist evil and to live in love and justice? I will, God, be my helper. Will you follow the way of Jesus Christ? I will, God, be my helper. Will you join with your brothers and sisters in this congregation to share in the life, work, and ministry of Jesus Christ? I will, God, be my helper. Let us pledge to these persons our continued support and care. As your brothers and sisters in Christ, we rejoice in your presence with us. We promise to support you walk with you and grow with you. With God's help, we will live out our baptism as a loving community in Christ, nurturing one another in faith, upholding one another in prayer, and encouraging one another in doing God's work. Okay, we're gonna do a prayer and a blessing, so we'll do one at a time. Ready? I'm gonna come to this side. Thank you. <laughs> so we're shuffling. 
Uh, Dawn of the power of the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of the water and spirit, you may continue to be a faithful witness of Jesus Christ. Amen. This there we go. Okay. <laughs> And Tim, the power of the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of the water and the Spirit, you may continue to be a faithful witness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us all join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, giver of life, you have called each of us by name and promised to hold each of us in your love. Today we rejoice that your Spirit has touched the lives of each of our candidates standing before you moving them to publicly affirm their faith in you. Remind us of all the baptisms made at baptism. Strengthen us to do your will and to serve you with joy through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. And may God bless each one of you as you go out into the world to love and serve our God. And so let us welcome Tim and Donna into full membership. Congratulations. We, ha we have no song for you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Maybe Carol will sing a little something as she's getting out. <laughs> just, just thought I would throw it out there for you. <laughs> but we are thrilled that you are joining us formally. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Welcome. It's our And perhaps after the service, you can just, you know, individually welcome people uh, in, in a kind of COVID-friendly way. I don't know how you do that, but do the best you can. <laughs> we'll continue in our worship with our scripture reading, which comes this morning to us from uh, Mark's Gospel. And we're reading from Mark 12, 38 to 44. As he taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people came and put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had all she had to live on. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. So when I was serving at my uh, previous charge at Princeton and Etonia, uh, one of our committees took on the task of going through the uh, safe that we had there that had all the, uh, all the records. And I have to admit, it, it was one of the largest church safes that I have ever seen. It, um, yeah, it was almost as tall as I am. And, 
It was big. I probably could have fit inside of it. I didn't try, but I probably could have fit inside of it. So inside, uh, so what we keep in a, in a church safe, um, it's not money usually. Um, wouldn't it be great if we had that much money to, that we needed such a big safe? But we keep the records, right? We keep the, all the, the registry records, the books of baptism, baptisms and weddings and, and funerals. And then we keep other important documents so that they, they're historical records. And so in this safe, there were, there were three shelves, one for each church. There was a church that was a third point on that charge and it had closed in the 80s. So there was a shelf for each of them. And I'm telling you, there were, whew, there were a lot of records. There were like records of church suppers, of like how much meat was bought, <laughs> which I'm not sure qualifies as a historical document. But anyway, there was all kinds of things and all the annual reports, you know, the annual report that you get each year. And so as we're looking through, we discovered that used to be the practice in the annual report to list what each household had donated to the church each year, the financial amount. Yeah, I can see people going, oh, I remember that. And also some people going, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> I'm glad we don't do that anymore. <laughs> because money kind of gets us uh, anxious a little bit, uh, doesn't it? Money, we call it like the root of all evil. I'm sure we've heard that phrase. It's something that we don't talk about much, at least our personal finances in, in public company, like we don't publish it anymore. And I don't know, uh, did anybody else's parents like tell you when you were little that you, know, you shouldn't ask anybody how much money they made? And my parents were like, you don't ask people how much money. You don't ask them how much they paid for their house or their car or their new shoes. Like you, you don't ask anybody that kind of personal information about their finances. And so it's interesting to me that we have that very private um, view on our, on our finances, but we publicly complain about money all the time. <laughs> or our lack thereof, right? Um, I'm thinking specifically in the past couple of weeks, we're hearing the reports about food costs rising, and we're all like, I don't have any more money for more food, or, or gas prices. I know we've seen those on the rise. So we talk about kind of money in general, but we never get uh, specific about it or personal about it. And the church is no exception to that, in my experience anyway. In United Churches, we don't talk specifically uh, about money, at least not in a way that I think is helpful and constructive. We don't like to ask for money. Um, we don't talk about faithful giving and what that looks like a lot. And I'm generalizing, there are churches that do. Uh, we do talk about how worried we are about maybe not meeting the budget or how we're going to put a new roof on or how we're gonna pay for a full-time minister. We do talk about those, those conversations do happen. Not usually collectively, they're usually little conversations that happen in pockets, which doesn't help us address any problems. But that refrain about worrying about not having enough seems to be getting louder and longer. And we see this shifting culture and the decline of church attendance and churches closing, not just in our area, not just in our denomination, but in multiple denominations right around the world. And so the church is living with this scarcity mindset when it comes to our churches, that belief that we don't have enough. And then we read the story about the widow, another widow story for us this week. And I reminded you last week that widows are in precarious positions in Bible times. They have no power and very little agency. So we have the widow in this story. And then we have the other people, uh, the scribes, the disciples are there, Jesus is there. And in the Ignatian practice of reading scripture, we are encouraged to find ourselves in the story. And you'll see, I often put that in as a reflection on the scripture. Do you identify with somebody in the story? Can you see yourself in that story? You know, how would it be to be in that story? How would that be for you? And it's a good practice. I use it many times. Uh, but the danger with that practice is that we use these characters as examples. 
So Caroline Lewis, who is a, a professor and a writer, a theologian, she writes, they cannot be always about those whom we say, wow, I need to be more like, or, oh, if I were more like. They have to be invitations to embody how we will follow Jesus. They have to be those that allow us to imagine what the kingdom of God looks like. And that kingdom starts with whole life living. And so you can relax because this isn't a passage about money at all. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you for more money. I'm not going to ask you to give till it hurts. This is not really a passage about, about money. If we look at the original Greek translation, Jesus' comment is not in fact that she gave all she had to live on in terms of those two coins, but the translation is that she gave her whole life. She gave her whole life. So Jesus' focus is not on her economic state, it is on her heart. And if you read through the Gospels, I have a feeling, oh, you can still hear me. If you can't hear me, let me know. If you read through the Gospels, you will see that Jesus never once was worried about how much money anybody was giving to the temple. Right? I'm not saying he didn't talk about money. But he never was like keeping the, he was never publishing in his annual report how much money people gave to the temple. He was never worried about that. He was worried about people's hearts, where their heart was. And so we can't look at this text and think about how much or how little we're giving and compare ourselves. Instead, we are called to take a look at the lives we're living not specifically how much money we're giving. It's about where our hearts are. Because if you read through scripture, it also says there, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. This is about where your heart is. Jesus isn't focusing on the temple economy. He, he's focusing on a new economy, one that's rooted in mission, the mission of becoming more loving, kind, and compassionate. One that is based on what the kingdom of God looks like and how we participate that in that wholeheartedly. That is what the church is called to do. And so when we consider this practice of tithing, the giving of 10% of our income to the church, which isn't something we talk about a lot, but, but that is a practice, 10% of your income before taxes, you know, that might seem lofty, <laughs> difficult. It might be darn near impossible for some people. And so you may be grateful that I'm not talking about tithing and asking you for that 10%. But Jesus is asking for even more from us. He's asking us to be all in, in the building of the kingdom. He's asking us to invest our hearts and minds and bodies and souls as we work together to transform our communities so that the quality of life is on the rise for all the people living around us to build an economy of love and health and well-being in our neighborhoods. So if you think that giving 10% of your income is tough, <laughs> I think Jesus is inviting us to do something even tougher. Jesus is asking us to get up close and personal with our neighbors, whether they're friends or enemies, and likely you have both, so that we can be in community together, in real community, not just saying, oh yeah, I live on this street, or I live in this community, a real community, a community that is connected, where we are aware of the hurts and the needs and the joys and the sorrows of the people in our neighborhood. And so quite frankly, you know, sometimes it's just easier to write a check and let somebody else look after the problem. But I think about the words of Brian Stevenson. He's a lawyer with the Equal Justice Initiative that operates out of Montgomery, Alabama. And he got into uh, law because he wanted to change the system. And in an interview that he, he had recently um, in a podcast, he quotes his grandmother as saying, you can't understand the important things from a distance, Brian, you have to get close. So he goes on to say, and for me, it's an important idea. 
It's interesting because in science and research, proximity is baked into the very heart of the discipline. If we create a cure for this virus, it's because the researchers and scientists understand the details of this virus with such precision and clarity that they've been able to create an answer. Innovation comes in science by the people who are able to pull something apart with such insight and knowledge that they can then innovate and they can create new. That's how we make progress. And I think the same is true in the justice sector, that we cannot make progress in creating a more just society, healthier communities, if we allow ourselves to be disconnected from the people who are most vulnerable, from the poor, the neglected, the incarcerated, the condemned. If you're trying to make policies in the criminal justice space, but you have never met someone who's in jail or in prison, or you haven't been to jail yourself, you're going to fail. I think sometimes he continues that when you're trying to do justice work, when you're trying to make a difference, when you're trying to change the world, the thing you need to do is to get close enough to the people who are falling down, get close enough to people who are suffering, close enough to people who are in pain, who've been discarded and disfavored, to get close enough to wrap your arms around them and affirm their humanity and their dignity. And that's why, whether you graduate from Harvard Law School or you graduate from college, whether you're a social worker or a teacher, you should not underestimate the power you have to affirm the humanity and the dignity of the people who are around you. And when you do that, they will teach you something about what you need to learn about human dignity, but also what you can do to be a change agent. And although he is talking specifically about changing laws and rules and regulations to make life more equitable and justice-oriented for those people on the margins, I think the same can be true when we are trying to build healthy, thriving, life-giving, joy-filled, connected communities, which I believe is the church at its best. We must get up close and personal. And that is uncomfortable and inconvenient because we are hardwired as human beings to do what is comfortable and what is convenient. Think about that in your own life. We will most often take the path of least resistance. We want to be comfortable. We want to be convenient. And getting up close and personal with people is neither of those two. So it's hard work. But you know, Jesus never said that following him was going to be easy. He never said that. But he did say, it would be good and life-giving. And so we are invited to look with the eyes of Jesus on the people around us, to take those words from the book of Deuteronomy, to love the, go the Lord your God with all your heart, all your being, all your might. All. Not 10%, not 50%, not even 90%, but with, but with all. It's a big ask. Are we as a church family coming alongside our neighbors? Are we getting to know them? Their hurts, their sorrows, their struggles, their joys? Are we participating in this new economy of life-giving communities of connectedness and joy and thriving? Are we investing in them? We may not be giving all. The good news is God can take our 10%, our measly 2%, God can take it all and do something good and amazing with it. But we are called to give all we can to God's economy of love. Amen. I like having a little soundtrack to my <laughs> talking over there. <laughs> 
Uh, so we didn't talk that much about money, but now we do as we shift into our time of offering and, and, and following our COVID regulations. Of course, we, we're not passing our offering plate, but we have just put it at the entrance there. So uh, thank you to all who put their offering in on the way in or will do it on the way out. Thank you to those who e-transfer and who give by par who find ways to support the life and the work and the mission of our church in this time and in this place. And so let us sing our offering Let us join our hearts and our voices in our offering prayer. O oh Lord, you graciously pour out your blessings on us. Your gifts surround us. All we have is a gift from your hand. Help us loosen our hands, giving to the work of this church on your behalf. For in giving freely to you, we gain the opportunity to live abundant lives. Amen. So a few announcements for you this week, and I will email them out. There's a few printed copies at the back if you are not an email recipient. Um, just a reminder, if you ordered gift cards uh, this past month, they are available. I think Don's probably been busy getting them passed out. Yep, okay. Uh, if you would like to order gift cards uh, this month, the deadline will be November the 28th. And that will be the last order for 2021. So if you're kind of looking ahead to, uh, for Christmas, that will be the last order. So the order forms are back, uh, the table is at the back and the order forms, once they're completed, can be put in that orange box. This is a really good way to just support uh, the church. You can, I, I know for myself, like I purchased gas cards and grocery cards because I'm buying those things anyway. And then a the small percentage goes back uh, to the church. So thank you for your support in that. Um, I will be on study leave this week. I'm doing an online course, so uh, there won't be a service next Sunday. We encourage you to tune in to the multitude of services you can find online. Uh, and then we will come back together on the 21st of, of November, which will be the day which we celebrate uh, All Saints. Not a traditional date, but a date that worked for us. All Saints is a day that we light candles. Uh, and honor the memories of those who have died in this past year. So if you would like to light a candle and name someone for that service, you can let me know or call Lynn in the office uh, and let us know by the 17th of, of November so that we can be prepared. Um, well, we made, well, I say we made mincemeat pies. I did not really participate in the making of mincemeat pies, but I was in the building, so I think somehow that counts. <laughs> mincemeat pies were made this week, and they are in the freezer ready for you to purchase. They are $5 for a five inch pie. So if you would like to purchase them, you can talk to Dawn or you can talk to Joanne, and they will get you set up. Please buy them all so they're not left over because I will not eat them. If there was brownies in the freezer, that's a whole other story. But <laughs> and it is also that time, I'm sure, uh, although it seems an assault to the senses if you've been out shopping, uh, all the Christmas stuff is in full gear in the stores. It's time to, to be thinking about Christmas. And we are doing our poinsettia fundraiser again. They're available in a variety of colors and sizes. The order form is also back on that table with the um, gift card order form. The deadline to order is November 28th, and then there'll be just curbside pickup on Saturday, December the 4th. I think that's all the announcements. Did I miss anything? It's just good to have announcements and have things going on in our church. Um, all right, any birthdays or anniversaries this week? 
Whew, yeah, feast or famine. All right, well, there we are. We'll skip over our singing of happy birthday, and we will just take a moment to pause and breathe and join our hearts in the prayers of our people. God, like the Israelites in the wilderness, we too have known your love and experienced your care and provision. You invite us to extend that love to the world around us, to care for others as deeply as we care for ourselves. And so we bring the needs of our world before you now. We pray for the many who do not have enough, enough food to eat or shelter to keep warm, enough employment or money to pay their bills enough medicine or medical care. We also pray for those who have more than enough, but who still struggle to find meaning and purpose in life, who indulge in dangerous or self-serving activities to dull their pain or loneliness. God, your grace reaches out to all of us. You call us to live as citizens of heaven, working together with one heart and mind. Move us out of our comfort zones into risky territory as we seek to get to know our neighbors so that we can create a thriving community where all are loved and known and welcomed and find their place at the table. As we look ahead to Remembrance Day this week, we do pray for all those who worked for our peace and well-being, for those who sacrificed and those whose lives were forever changed. We pray for our political leaders who are gathered to address climate change and for the activists who continue to sound the alarm and offer solutions. We pray for those whose grief weighs heavily on them. We pray for all those who are COVID weary. We lift up those who are on our hearts and minds this day we pray for Lynn and Linda and the Wilson family. And in the silence, we lift up the prayers of each of our hearts. Strengthen us to live in a manner worthy of the good news we have received, offering our lives in service of your kingdom where the last are first, and the first are last, and there is grace enough for all. God of us all, we lift up our hearts and our prayers, knowing that you had them all along, offering it all in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Our final hymn this morning comes from our, more vo or our Voices United hymn book, I'm Going to Live So God Can Use Me, and so I will invite you to stand and again sing, hum, whatever, and remain standing as we give the benediction. So let's sing together.
keep Diane on her toes because she never knows how many verses I'm going to put up for something. So. <laughs> now as you get ready to go out and live this week well, keep your eyes, hearts, and mind on Christ Jesus as we see love revealed in the smallest of gestures. May you be moved beyond your comfort zone as you reach out to your neighbors. May you love abundantly and may you receive love graciously. Amen.